Okay, there's that red light we've been looking for. All right. Glad to see all of you here in the studio, and uh, for those of you out in television, again, we'd just like to invite you to sit down with your Bible and your pen and notepad and just study with us. I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to be lecturing you. Uh, we're going to be teaching just like any other teacher would out of a textbook, which means that we're going to use as many scriptures as possible to uh, not prove the point of Les Feldick, but to prove the point of God's Word. Now, uh, we just announced to our studio audience that we just got back from three weeks down in Florida, had a great time, and uh, the very first church where we started down at Fort Myer, the pastor had asked before I even left Oklahoma if, he says, I never tell a visiting speaker what to speak on, but he said, if you feel so led, he said, I would really appreciate if you would address why we stand on a pre-tribulation rapture. Because he said, I'm under the understanding that we're under attack for that like never before. And of course, I'm hearing it from every quarter that uh, people are almost getting aggressively hateful about our stand on a pre-trib rapture. And so I agreed wholeheartedly. And so we were there for Sunday morning Sunday school hour, the morning service hour, the evening service, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night for an hour to an hour and a half each night. And uh, as people were leaving, that's what gave me the idea. They would say, Les, why don't you make a series of programs on this? And I said, well, we'll consider it. So the more I thought about it and prayed about it, it just seemed as though this was the way we're going to go. So I don't know how many programs it's going to take. I don't know where we'll end any one particular program. We're just going to be flying free on this. And uh, when we run out of time, we'll stop and we'll just start up where we left off. So uh, we're going to start on the premise that... You cannot, you cannot understand the concept of the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming and the kingdom without being a dispensationalist. Now, it's a hated word in a lot of quarters and uh, as if it isn't even scriptural. But I have put four verses on the, wor on the board and we'll look at them briefly. And uh, they all make reference to that very term, a dispensation. So we'll just look at them as you got them up here. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. And uh, while you're looking that up, I'll just share an ex experience with one of my listeners. And uh, several years ago, he approached his pastor and he says, Pastor, he says, why don't you ever preach a sermon on the rapture? Oh, he said, I wouldn't dare do that. Then I'd be a dispensationalist. Well, what's so bad with that? <laughs> but they're almost afraid of the term as if it's an unbiblical concept. But I'm going to show you that it is a scriptural term. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, where Paul writes, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will... A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Dispensation. And we're going to explain that in more detail after we've looked at these four verses. All right, now the next one then is Ephesians 1.10. Just keep on going to the right through Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10. And again, Paul, by Holy Spirit inspiration, remember, Paul doesn't write one word that isn't inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he uses the term. And isn't it amazing that much of Christendom detests it? A biblical term, a scriptural term, but they do. And uh, if we get a letter at all that's less than kind, that's what it's over. How can you teach this false theory of a rapture? Well, this is why, because it's biblical, all right? Ephesians 1, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Well, that's a different dispensation than the one we're in, but it's still the same term. Now, the next one, I think, is chapter 3, isn't it? Verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, and this is actually the verse that we used in every service under those circumstances, and I was actually asking my audience to memorize this verse. And it's easy to memorize, and uh, it's a good foundation for our approach to Scripture. 
For if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, that's the one in which we are. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, but it doesn't stay there, where does it go? To you, and who are the you that Paul is writing to? Gentiles, see? So the dispensation of grace is a set of instructions, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit, that God has given to us as Gentiles in particular. All right, now the next one is on much the same program or uh, line of thinking. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Same word. Means the same thing in every case. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Wait till you all find it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Whereof? In fact, let's read verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, which again is a term only used in Paul's epistles. You never see the body of Christ mentioned anywhere else. All right, so that he was afflicted bodily with all of his imprisonments, his beatings, and what have you, for the sake of the church, which is his body. Now verse 25, whereof? So the body of Christ is connected to this apostle, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, for what purpose? To fulfill or to complete or bring to total fruition the word of God. And so dispensationally speaking, everything that God has done from Adam in the garden down through the very end of the kingdom age and we go into eternity, is based on a dispensational approach to Scripture. Now, we usually define a dispensation as simply as possible. If you haven't already put it in a flyleaf of your Bible, you might want to. A, a dispensation is a period of time. A dispensation is a period of time during which God deals with the human race in a particular way. Now, I think a few tapings back, I more or less explained it. Like if you went to the doctor a few years ago, or maybe a short time ago, for whatever trouble you had, we'll just say you went in for a bad cough. And so he gives you a prescription for your cough. Well, you take it to the pharmacist, he fills the prescription not only with your cough medicine, but what does he put on the outside of the bottle? The directions on how often and how much to take it. All right, now then, some months later, you've come up with maybe an arthritis attack and your joints are hurting, so you go to the doctor and he prescribes something for your arthritis. And for sake of illustration, we'll again hope that we can use a, a liquid medicine rather than pills. So he puts your liquid medicine for your arthritis in a bottle, and you get home, and my, now you've got two medicine bottles in your chest, and you think, well, maybe it would be working better than if I just mix them. So you take the caps off your two different kinds of medication, and you mix them, and now you don't know how much of which one to take. Why? Because you're all confused. All right, isn't that exactly what they've done with Scripture? They've mixed all the dispensations together and claim that we only use one Bible, that's true, and I just use the whole Bible, what you're doing is just mixing all the dispensations and you end up with nothing that's going to do you any good but cause confusion. Now, you know, as a rule, I've always pictured over the years as putting it in a blender, blenderizing the Scripture. But see, this is why there is so many different denominations. There are so many groups. They just put it all together and then they pick and choose, whereas if they would just separate these various times during which God dealt with the human race in a particular way, it clears up everything. All right, now, I always go back to the Garden of Eden as the most simple dispensation in all of human history because of the time element as well as the directions for it. Now, we don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the Garden. I don't even make a guess. 
But I do know that while they were in the garden, God only gave them one set of directions. And it was simple. Of that tree you shall not eat. Anything else is for you. But of that one tree you shall not eat. Now that was their directions for that dispensation. Simple, wasn't it? That's all they had to do. You just leave that tree alone. And God would be satisfied and he, and he would bless them. But after a period of time, like I said, I don't know how long, they ate. Well, then the wrath of God fell because they were disobedient and judgment came in and they were cast out of the garden. Well, that ended that period of time during which they lived day by day under that one direction. You shall not eat of it. Well, you come on up through history then and uh, we have a couple other periods of time where God's put out some distinct instructions and I haven't got time to go into them, but I'm going to jump all the way up to the time that Israel now comes out of Egypt and they go under the dispensation of what we call law. As they are gathered around Mount Sinai, Moses goes up into the mount and God gives to Moses the set of directions for the nation of Israel under the law, which included, of course, the Ten Commandments. But that wasn't all. They were also given instructions on how to deal with sin, how to approach God through the priesthood with sacrifices, and that was all part of their directions. And as long as they maintained a semblance of obedience to that, God's wrath didn't really fall. But after 1,500 years, now then, the whole reason the law was given their Messiah appeared in fruition of all the promises of God. Now that brings me to the other verse I was going to have the studio audience look at first, and that brings you back to Romans 15, verse 8. After 1,500 years of just more or less practicing the religion of law, or Judaism, now God comes in with a little extra responsibility for Israel, and that was to recognize that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah. All right, now I use that word promised specifically for this reason. Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was, now this is Paul writing years after the fact, that past tense, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. And always stop and read carefully. So who is he a minister to? Israel, the Jew. They don't lose that. He was a minister to Israel. For what purpose? To confirm or to fulfill, again, to bring to fruition the promises made to the fathers. Well, who were the fathers? Old Testament Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then on up to David and Solomon and the prophets, Isaiah. Every one of them were looking forward to the time when God would send a Redeemer and a Messiah and a King to the nation of Israel to fulfill all the promises. Well, the promises were primarily this glorious earthly kingdom that Israel was looking for. Now, Solomon's kingdom was just a little foreview, just a little tip of the iceberg of the glory that was waiting for Israel. But they would have to become obedient and believe who their Messiah was when he came. Now, that brings me up to current events. When Christ came, should Israel have known who he was? Absolutely. The Old Testament was full of it. But did they? For the most part, no. All right, now then in Matthew 16, I think I can have you come back there with me. Come back with me to Matthew 16. And uh, this will probably uh, appeal to the interest of present day current events for a few moments. Matthew 16, because <clears throat> I may just ramble kind of free today. I'm not on a set format to go verse by verse through a particular chapter. So bear with me. I hope I don't lose you. <clears throat> now in Matthew 16, now just to refresh your memory, so in 15 seconds you haven't lost where I've come from, Jesus came to fulfill the promises made to the fathers, right? All right, and I asked the question, should they have known who he was? Sure they should have, but did they? No. All right, now here's Jesus 
approaching the Pharisees, and he's really dressing them down. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting or desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now the Jews were always looking for signs, you know. Now look at his answer. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, you say it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Now look at what he's telling them. Oh, you hypocrites. Oh, you false whited sepulchers. You can discern the face of the sky. You can foretell tomorrow's weather. But you cannot discern the what? The signs of the times. Now, he was talking in regard to his own presence. They should have been understood understanding that they were now in the fourth of Daniel's empires, which was the Babylonian, the Mede, and the Persian, and the Greek, and now the Roman. They were in it. The Romans were over Jerusalem. That was the number one sign. That should have told them that this is the time that we can look for the Messiah. But did they? They didn't have a clue. Well, various other aspects of his, of his appearance. They should have been able to foretell who he was and what he was doing on the basis of the scriptures. But they couldn't. Now it's the same way today. We are living under the exact kind of circumstances. The signs of the times, beloved, and you out in television, they're everywhere. A few people are waking up and realizing it. In fact, I just had a young man just the other day call, and he was so excited that his pastor, who had been a mainline pastor for years, never touched prophecy, because they won't, and I'll explain why a little later this afternoon. He suddenly realized now that with the signs of the time, maybe he better get into prophecy. And so he's starting to change his mind by it. All right, so I'm always asking, wherever I go, if I approach this subject, the signs of the times, what is the number one sign that we are in the end time and Christ's coming is not that far off? Israel back in the land. That should just scream at everybody, whether they know anything of Scripture or not, how miraculously the Jews have come back from every nation under heaven and they're in their own land against all odds. They should have never succeeded. But they did. But they didn't do it. God did it, because the word said, after you've been scattered to every nation under heaven, you will return. That's in Deuteronomy, written by Moses 3,500 years ago, beloved. But here it is, the number one sign of the times, Israel back in the land. In fact, I had a young man a while come back, 22-year-old. He said, Les, how can I approach my own age kids? We call them peers without them thinking that I'm just getting on a religious tangent. I said, well, start with current events. Sometime when you're just having a, a, whatever the kids call it today, we used to call it a bull session when I was in service, but anyway, you just sort of start chewing all this stuff over. I said, just remind them, why is a little nation of only around five, now I guess they're approaching six million people, why is that little nation in the news every day? United Nations is constantly meeting concerning that one little nation in the world. Why? I said, just ask your fellow young people. Do you ever think about that? A little country sitting on a piece of real estate smaller than half of New Jersey and in the news every day? That's not common, ordinary carryings-on of the world, but it's a supernatural thing. All right, then from that, hopefully you can show them that our Bible is true, that no matter how much Israel is opposed and no much, how much they're hated, Yet, they're there, and they're there by God's design. Well, and then all the other things. My, do you ever stop to think, what is rolling over Christendom today like never before, but it has all started since about 1900? And I don't have to remind you of many of them, but number one, an understanding of end-time scriptures. That was almost unknown until after 1900. The other thing is the, the coming in like a tsunami of the New Age religions. 
My, they're appealing to our young people and they're falling for it by the millions. New age. And uh, over another, I thought, well, our, our secular technology. Imagine the technology. And like a reminder of one of my groups in Florida last week, you ever stop to think that back in the 70s, the powers that be in the world were just wringing their hands because with population exploding, we would never be able to keep up with them with food production? Have we? Why land more food is thrown out in garbage than what the world ever imagined producing. And there's no reason for anybody to go hungry. The only reason there's people starving is not production, it's distribution. There it sits in warehouses. I read the other day that all the aid that poured into Indonesia over the tsunami, most of it is still sitting in warehouses. They don't know how to distribute. But nevertheless, see, God has provided that no matter how far humanity comes, everything comes along with it. And that's God's design. Otherwise, we would never have gotten this far. See, that's why I'm not all shook up about this so-called global warming. God's in control. He's not going to let it destroy itself. Not until he's ready to do it himself. So always remember, they get all shook up about these things, but they leave God out of the picture. Well, on and on we could go. Oil. Can you imagine how production and distribution keeps up with all these billions of automobiles and planes and everything, and yet the world keeps going. Well, that's not an accident. That's our God who is in control of everything. Well, anyway, when Jesus said then, know the signs of the times, it was just as much a warning for us today as it was for the despicable Pharisees of his day. And so I could even go a little further yet, but I think that's sufficient, that we are to understand we are at the close of the age and the signs of the times are all around us. All you have to do is watch your daily news, the breakdown of morality, the uh, apostasy of the church. My goodness, you can't believe what people are hearing coming over their pulpits, and we hear it in our phone calls. Well, that's all part of the end time scenario. It's a sign of the time. Well, all right, I only got five minutes left, and uh, we just started back with uh, Christ being the, the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. All right, in the five minutes left, uh, we have left, we've got to look at the big picture before we can begin to even make sense about an end time scenario which includes the outcalling of the body of Christ. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 for just a little bit because uh, unless you understand Israel's role, you'll never understand the Bible. But Israel is the key player. They have been from day one and they will be on into eternity. Never forget that. Now, the first 11 chapters of Genesis were God dealing with one race of people, and it was a sorry scenario. There's hardly a good point in the first 11 chapters, because after Adam and Eve are created, the first thing they do is rebel. They're disobedient. They're cast out of the garden. Well, then the kids come along, and one kills the other. It's just, just one awful thing after another. Well... Then it just kept getting worse and worse and worse until finally destroyed them in the flood. Then after the flood, God starts over with Noah and his three sons and their wives, and it still doesn't get any better because 200 years later, they're gathered at the Tower of Babel, and it was nothing but a great rebellion again against God and the establishing of their own human gods and goddesses, which we call mythology. And then after another 200 years, when it seems as though everything is just continuing to go, go down, 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 then God steps in once more, and he brings out one man, just one man, Abram. And here is the big change then in Scripture, because from chapter 12 of Genesis, like I said, until we go into eternity, Israel becomes the focal point of all of God's dealing with the human race. They're at the core of everything. And, of course, Satan knew that. He knows it. And so he's been attacking them ever since, trying to destroy them, because Satan knows if he can knock Israel out of the loop, then God's program for the human race falls apart. All right, we've got two minutes left, a little over. G Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. 
and I will make of thee a great nation, which of course is a reference to Israel. I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him who curseth thee. And then here's the promise that brings us into the picture, that in Abram, <coughs> in thee, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not just Israel, but the whole human race would be blessed through the promises that God would make to this one man, Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. All right, now then, for sake of time, in the minute or two we have left, jump over to chapter 15. <coughs> Verse 7, and this in the first place shows the humanity of this man Abram. He was just as human as we are, and God has just promised him all these things. And so verse 7, he said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land. Now remember, they're already standing on the mountains of Israel or in the land of Canaan. And God says, I will give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How do I know you're going to do it? How can I know that you mean business? Well, God says, I'll deed it to you. So you come on over to the end of the chapter now. After going through the process of transferring title deed as the ancients did it under the laws of Hammurabi, now then, verse 18, in the same day, that God deeded the whole Middle East from the Nile River to the Euphrates and back. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land. That's a word of God. It's his promise. I have given you this land from the river of Egypt. That's probably the Nile, but if not, it's right close to it. The river Euphrates. And in all the tribes that were involved in that Middle Eastern area, God says, I will give it to you and your children after you. And we know, of course, that that's exactly what all the Old Testament promises rest on, that this whole Middle East was deeded to the man Abram and that it was to be the homeland of the Jew for all the period of time that this planet will function. And that has never been rescinded. And we'll look at some of the opposition to that as we go on through the afternoon. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Hey, it's good to have everybody back and you've had your break and uh, I don't get one. I guess it's the same way in my seminars, you know, everybody has a break, but I never get one. They just surround me all day long, but same way here. I don't ever get a chance to start ta stop talking. But anyway, we're glad you're here and for those of you joining us on television, Again, we just uh, can never find words to thank you for your prayers, your letters. My, how we enjoy the letters. And uh, then, of course, your financial gifts. We can't stay on the air without them. But uh, a lot of people can't understand how we do it without begging for money. I said it from day one. Gary remembers it as well as day. I said, if I have to beg for money, I'm going home. And uh, that's the way we've always been. I will not. And uh, if we have to get that place, why then we'll just start dropping stations. And if the Lord wants us off the air, then we'll quit. But uh, until then, we expect the greatest fundraiser in the whole fundraiser in the whole universe will take care of our every need. And he does. It's just unbelievable. And so we do. We thank you out there for your constant support and your love for us wherever we go. All right, now we're going to keep moving toward why do we teach and admonish and absolutely firmly believe that as New Testament believers, members of the body of Christ, we will not see the Antichrist. We'll have a lot of guesses, but we will never find out who he is because before he shows up, we're gone. And uh, I guess what people can't handle is, how's God going to do it? Well, I always come back to the Lord's words himself. With God, what? Nothing is impossible. Don't ever think that something is beyond him. I don't care what it is. And uh, so even though the rapture does seem like an impossibility with God, never happened. All right, so we're going to continue on. What brings us up to this glorious dispensation of the grace of God but we're going to go back now to a previous dispensation, the one just ahead of us, which was Israel under the law. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 19 for just a moment. 
They were just fresh out of Egypt. They became a nation down there, according to Genesis. And now they're gathered around the mount, and Moses has gone up to meet with the Lord face to face. And uh, here's the account of it now in Exodus 19, and I guess we'll jump in at verse 3, honey. <clears throat> Exodus 19, verse 3. Moses went up unto God, that is, up in the Mount Sinai. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. In other words, the whole nation of the twelve tribes. Now God says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. In other words, brought them out of Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea miraculously, brought them now around Mount Sinai. Now verse 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed. Now does that ring a bell, what I said about Adam and Eve? What were they to do with regard to that forbidden tree? Be obedient. But what were they? Disobedient. And so things happened. All right, now same way with Israel. If they maintain a semblance of obedience, God doesn't expect perfection, but he said, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, the one he's going to give in chapter 20, the Ten Commandments and everything associated with it, and if you'll keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure or a treasure of intrinsic value unto me above all people. Now, I think I stressed this in tapings not too far back, that here's where we see the sovereignty of God declare Israel as the favored nation, the nation that is above all other nations in every category that you can imagine. And the reason God can do it, he's sovereign. All the earth is mine. I can do whatever I want. Now, you know, once in a while, man himself gets to that place where he thinks he owns so much, he's got so much control that he can do whatever he wants. Well, he may think he can, but he's still limited. But God can. God is unlimited. All right, and so here we have it, that all the earth is mine. Now verse 6 is the key verse. And Israel is to be a kingdom of priests. Now, like I just asked somebody yesterday, what do you have to have in order to have a valid kingdom? A king. See? What's a king without a kingdom? Well, he's a nothing. Well, what's a kingdom without a king? Nothing. So you've got to bring the two together, that here Israel is promised now to be a kingdom, but latent in that promise is there will be a king coming sooner or later. All right, now then, just for sake of time, I won't, I, my listening audience is probably getting anxious that I jump up into the New Testament. But let's go all the way up to Zechariah. Next to the last book in your Old Testament. Now, there are a lot of intervening verses, but we pretty much covered them, I think, in uh, fairly recent programs. But now in Zechariah chapter 14, it is in such plain language. How can anybody disagree with it unless they are just flagrantly disobedient? But here we have Zechariah 14, verse 9. Now remember, Zechariah is getting up pretty close to the New Testament in Matthew already. Math, uh, Zechariah 14, verse 9. And the Lord, now remember that's all capitalized, so that's Jehovah, or it's God the Son, Israel's Messiah. The Lord shall be, at some future day, king over all the earth. Now can you get it any plainer now? I don't know how you can. He hasn't yet, but he's going to. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords over planet earth. And it'll be a totally renovated surface of the earth. Though it's still going to be going in its orbit around the sun. It's still going to be functioning as a planet. But the surface is going to be totally renovated. Now, all you have to do is just use a little 12-year-old imagination with all the hundreds and hundreds of nuclear weapons that are in storehouses around the planet once they start exploding them, how long will it take to incinerate the planet? Not long. And that's what's going to happen. They're all going to be exploded one way or another in God's own time. And this old planet is literally going to be reduced to ashes and God will plow them all under 
and out will come that glorious thousand-year millennial reign of Christ on a renovated, regenerated, reconstituted earth. And uh, I can see it with no problem at all. My goodness, when you realize how nuclear energy can just reduce steel to absolute nothing, and we've got all these hundreds upon thousands of nukes, and now I read in yesterday's paper that we are going to start building a new generation of them, that are even better yet, well, it's just all adding to the stockpile, and God is smiling in his heaven, and he says, have at it, boys, you're getting it all ready for me, and uh, they're going to destroy themselves. So that's what's coming, whether they like to admit it or not, but out of it. Now remember, the book of Daniel gives us 75 days after the return of Christ and the end of the tribulation until things begin to flow into everyday activity. And I think it's that 75 days that the earth will come back up and be like a renewed garden of Eden. All right, so read the verse once more. Zechariah 14, 9. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day, that is starting with his second coming to the Mount of Olives, and in that day there shall be one Lord and his name one, which of course fits perfectly with Revelation 19, and his name shall be called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, now then, as you come into Matthew, we see that Christ makes his appearance at his first coming, but before he appears, we have John the Baptist, the herald, and he's going to announce to the nation of Israel that their king is in their midst. So jump up to Matthew chapter 3, and uh, Israel has now been under the law, temple worship, Judaism as we understand it, for 1,500 years. And now the Messiah makes his appearance according to prophecy. Matthew 3, verse 1. <clears throat> in those days came John the Baptist. Now remember what goes ahead of it in chapter 1 is the birth of Christ down at Bethlehem. And so in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. That's what it says. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, now there's that word kingdom again. What's it talking about? The earthly kingdom that Zechariah was just talking about a few pages back and over which the, the Son of God, Israel's Messiah, will rule and reign. It's finally ready to come about. All right, now Israel here is at a crossroads. Are they going to believe it? Are they going to accept it? Or are they going to reject it? And I'm always making a parallel with Kadesh Barnea. You remember when they came to Kadesh? What did God tell him? The promised land. There it is. It's all yours with all of its production and all of its farms and orchards and pastures on land flowing with milk and honey. And I always have to qualify, what does it mean flowing milk and honey? Everything that it would take to produce humongous amounts of dairy milk, which would be what? Fresh water and grass and all the other things that it takes to produce milk. All right, what does it take to produce honey? flowers and blooms and all the things that bees can use. Well, you put all that together, what kind of a landscape does it give you? Beautiful, productive, see? And so that's where they're looking at. But did they take it? No. In unbelief, they said thanks, but no thanks. And they went back into the desert and died like flies. What a pity. But see, they're confronted again. The king is in your midst. Can you believe it? No, can't believe it. And so they turned it down again. And so this is the whole concept then of his earthly ministry was to prove to the nation of Israel who he was. You've heard me sound that off now for 15 years. This is why he performed the miracle, to prove that he was the promised Messiah. But Israel wouldn't buy it. And they rejected and rejected and rejected. All right, now then, let's just move all the way up into the book of Acts. And uh, I guess I almost have to start or stop at Acts chapter 1. And uh, look at verse 6 for just a moment. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 6. The Lord has just been resurrected and spent 40 days in his resurrected body 
with the twelve walking up and down the byways and the roadways of ancient Israel from Galilee to Jerusalem. And he was again proving that he was alive. He was the Son of God with all of his power. And he was yet able to be the king promised to Israel. All right, so now after those 40 days are over, they're assembled up there on the Mount of Olives. Of course, they don't know that he's going to suddenly take off from their midst and go back to glory. But nevertheless, they're in conversation here on the Mount of Olives at the end of the 40 days. And um, verse 6, When they were therefore come together, Jesus and the eleven, now Judas is gone, Matthias hasn't yet come in, so when Jesus and the eleven were there on the Mount of Olives, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, that's the key word. Lord, are you ready to bring in the kingdom? Well, he couldn't as long as Israel was in unbelief. Because the whole thing is tied to Israel's recognizing who he is. Otherwise, he can't bring it about. All right, so then... Verse 7, he doesn't ridicule their, their question. It was a valid question. And look at his answer. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Today we say it's not for you to know the here and when. But here it is. It's not for you to know the time. See, the kingdom is coming, but the Lord wouldn't tell him when. All right, so he says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. All right, now then, when you come to a little further along in the book of Acts, let's go to chapter 2. The Lord is ascended back to glory. He is established with the eleven that he's alive and well. He can still fulfill the promises of a kingdom. Now in chapter 2, it was a Jewish feast day, the Feast of Pentecost, and Jews, of course, have gathered from every nation in the then known world to come to the temple for the Feast of Pentecost, as they did for all the feasts throughout the year. All right, so we have a conglomeration of Jews from every nation under heaven, and we have the miracle of Pentecost. All right, now then, let's just drop down to... Verse 5, in Acts chapter 2, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men. Now they were devout according to the law, remember. They're keeping the temple worship, the sacrifices, the whole nine yards. And they were out of, now watch this carefully, every nation under heaven. In other words, here they were, probably as far back as India, and, and Persia, which is present-day Iran, from what's present-day Arabia, and over to present-day Iraq, which was Babylon, and Syria, and Egypt, and North Africa. They had gathered from every part of the then known world for this Feast of Pentecost. But they're all Jews, see? All right, so they're coming from every nation under heaven. Now verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because every man, whether he's from North Africa or he's from China or India or Timbuktu, every man heard, uh, let's see, that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, do you have to be a seminary graduate to understand that? In other words, if they were from Syria, they heard it in the local language of the Syrians, because after all, Jews had been there now for generations, and the second, third, fourth generation start speaking the local language, and they had forgotten their, their Hebrew or whatever. Or if they came from Turkey, they were t speaking the language of the Turks and so forth. Every Jew gathered there in that Pentecostal crowd were hearing the twelve, or especially Peter, James, and John, I think, speak in their own language, see? And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Well, there are not these all Galileans. Now, of course, the point I always make when I teach these things, are there any Gentiles involved? Not a one. There's not a Gentile in here. This is a Jewish phenomena. And never forget that. All right, now then, when you come down to verse 22, it's again obvious. Chapter 2, verse 22. Now Peter says, Ye men of Israel. Israel. 
That's Jews. Hear these words. And he goes through who Jesus was and what had happened and how God had raised him up and that he could still bring in the glorious kingdom that has been promised all the way up through the Old Testament. All right, so all through these early chapters, in fact, let's just stop at chapter 3. I'm just having to show you now how we are in the transitional part of Scripture. We're moving from Israel under the law and Judaism, and we're going to move to the place where the Apostle Paul comes and is sent to the Gentile world because of Israel's rejection of everything. All right? Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And Peter again is preaching to the nation of Israel. And uh, verse 12. And what precipitates this, they have just healed the lame man up there at the temple. And the Jews are all shook up. Where did these guys get the wherewithal to heal this guy who has been lame for 40 years? Well, I always have to remind my listeners, how long has it been since Jesus' earthly ministry ended? About eight weeks. See, no, a little more than that. 50 days plus 10, about 60 days. Yeah, two months. That's all. Two months after his probably performing his last miracle, the twelve perform, and they can't figure it out. How did you do this? See, Well, then Peter, verse 12, when he saw the consternation, I guess is the word I've used before, when he saw the confusion amongst the Jews over these men healing this lame man, verse 12, when Peter saw it, he answered the people, ye men of Israel, how many Gentiles are in that statement? Well, not a one. Ye men of Israel, why marvel at this, or why look so earnestly, unless that though we by our own power holiness made this man the one? The God of Abraham. Did that mean anything to the average down-on-the-road Gentile? Why, no, nothing. But to a Jew, everything. See? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up, denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and desired a murder to be granted unto you. You killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now, watch this carefully. Now, I'm reading it rather speedily for sake of time. But when you get home or when you're in your own Bible study, read these verses just slowly and deliberately. And note that never does Peter associate the salvation of these Jews on that finished work of the cross. All Peter is showing here is the one that they demand to be put to death is alive and still can fulfill the promises. You can't have a dead man ruling as a king. Can you? Well, of course not. But he's not dead. The tomb is empty. He's alive. And Peter is proving that. He can still be the king. Now, what did Israel have to do? Well, nothing has changed so far as the nation is concerned. Drop down to verse 19. And they try to push all this into our Pauline economy. And that's why there's so much confusion, see? What's the first word? Repent. How did John the Baptist start? Repent. <laughs> See, nothing has changed. Nothing. Repent, therefore, and be converted or have a change of mind concerning whom? Jesus of Nazareth. That's the problem. That's what they're to repent of now, that they killed and rejected the promised Messiah. All right, so they're to repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What's the times of refreshing? The king and his kingdom, heaven on earth. My, wouldn't it be something to look forward to that maybe next week all of a sudden all of our sin problem would disappear, all of the heartache of this world would stop, and all of a sudden we'd have heaven on earth. Refreshing is almost a calm word, isn't it? But that's what he says. They could have it all if they would just confess and repent of the sin primarily now of having rejected their Messiah. Now, if you think I'm kidding, you look at verse 20. What would God do if Israel would repent? God would send Jesus, see? 
he would send Jesus Christ, the same one of the earthly ministry who was preached unto you, to be the king. But the Holy Spirit, I think, prompts Peter to not get too exuberant because there is a period of time that has to be fulfilled from the Old Testament prophecies before the king can come under any circumstances. And what time is that? Tribulation. The seven years of horror have to come. You can't skip them. And so this is what the next verse says, verse 21. The same Jesus Christ, whom heaven must receive or hold, just like Psalms 110 said, come sit at my right hand until, all right? So heaven must hold him until the times of restitution of all all things which the prophets have spoken of since the world began. Well, what's the time of restitution? I just gave you a graphic example. When after the seven years of the horror of the tribulation and all the nukes have been exploded, all the volcanoes have done all their work and all the earthquakes, this old planet is going to be completely reduced to ashes and out of it will come a glorious new planet like the Garden of Eden from one pole to the other. All right. Then he goes on to say, now remember, this is all the Old Testament promises being rehearsed before the nation of Israel. Now verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. He will be a fellow Jew, as Jesus was, of course. And he'll raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. In other words, as Moses was a deliverer, so Christ his second coming will be a deliverer. And him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, because he's going to be your king. Now verse 23. And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed or removed from among the people. Because there's no unbelievers going into the kingdom. None. And they'll be removed, and Jesus made that so plain in his earthly ministry that they will go to their perdition, and the believers will go into the kingdom. All right, now read on. Our time is just about gone already. And uh, verse 24, Yea, all the prophets, all the Old Testament practically, from Samuel on, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, all the Old Testament prophets, have likewise foretold of these days. That's why you remember that when I start teaching the <coughs> prophets, like the minor prophets, it's repetition. Yeah, you know, that's why I kind of have a hard time taking them down the road because people are going to say, well, Les, you just had that last month. But that's what it is. All the prophets are rehearsing to Israel the coming of this glorious kingdom, but before the kingdom can come, the wrath of God must precede it. All right, and so Peter's reminding them. Same thing. All the prophets told of these things, see? Now then, verse 25. You are the children of the prophets. Now, who is he talking to? Jews. Not a Gentile in the picture here. And all the prophets from Samuel. And you are the children, verse 25. You are the children of the prophets. You are the children of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto whom? Abraham. See, that's why I started back there this afternoon with chapter 12. This all started with Abraham and the appearance of the nation of Israel. All right? And uh, the covenant with God made with Abraham and in thy seed, that is, in the offspring of Abraham, shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now, just for one little glimpse, only a part of all that is this book. This book came from the offspring of Abraham. That's part of what he's talking about. And listen, where would this world be without this book? It's bad enough as it is. But oh, it would be so much worse. And this is where we draw all our comfort. And it all became by the prophets and the coming of the nation of Israel whom God used to give us the printed word. All right, we got half a minute left. Then uh, verse 26, and we'll have to wind up. Unto you first, the nation of Israel, with all of their promises, with all of their written scriptures, unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus. Now, you remember what the raised up meant. 
He was raised from the dead. He's no longer dead. He's alive and well. All right? God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away how many? Every one from their iniquity. But is Israel turned? No. And so then we're going to see in our next program, where do we go from here? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Okay, here we go for program number three. You've all had your break, and I've had mine, and uh, we're going to go right back in where we left off, and we're going to keep going on Acts chapter 7. And again, we want to thank our television audience for everything. Lord, we just uh, we can't thank you enough. And for all your prayers, your financial help, your letters, your encouragement, and uh, we just trust that one day we'll all meet in glory, and I don't know whether we're going to have the wherewithal to know how all this transpired or not. But if we do, boy, it's going to be a great reunion. It, it really is. You know, even today we had folks that met some relatives they didn't even know were around. <laughs> and uh, that's what we like about our ministry. And uh, Iris said it on our way to Florida the other day. She said, you know, the best part of our ministry is how many friends have been brought together and uh, new friends and uh, they continue to be friends for years to come. And uh, that's all part of it, that when like-minded believers get together and meet new friends, it, it's quite a thrilling experience. Okay, we're going to continue right on now, heading toward why are we adamant on our pre-tribulation rapture? Well, you have to get the big picture to understand what we're talking about. You can't just jump in and say, well, this is what it says. Well, yes, so far as we're concerned. But for the doubting Thomas, you've got to show him the big picture. All right, and that's what we're moving toward. Acts chapter 7, and uh, Stephen, of course, is addressing the high priest and some of the other religious leaders of Israel. And uh, this is their last opportunity to repent of having killed their Messiah and yet recognize him for what he was. And so Stephen just lays it all out on the line throughout this chapter 7. And uh, if you have any doubt that he's talking to Jews, why, all you have to do is come down to verse 51. He's winding up his message. And again, remember, this is all Holy Spirit inspired. Not a word of this is anything but God's word. And Stephen says to these religious leaders, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart. Oh, they were circumcised in the flesh. Don't think they weren't, but heart, no uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, going back to Israel's history, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? In other words, all the way through Israel's history, when the prophets would come and warn them of chastisement to come and uh, the blessings that could follow, what would they do? They would kill the messenger over and over. Jeremiah was found in a dungeon when the Babylonians came to Jerusalem. And so Stephen is reminding them of all that. Which of the prophets, verse 52, <clears throat> have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain or killed them who showed before, that is the prophets now, who showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Pretty strong language, isn't it? In fact, as a rule, when I teach these early chapters of Acts, I always remind folks, is this the message that you hear me or anyone else proclaim today? You killed the Messiah, repent of it? No. But for Israel, that was their dilemma. They had in unbelief rejected their Messiah and killed him, and that's what they were guilty of. You and I, it's just the other side of the coin. He loved us and died for us. See, that's the big difference. All right, so now then, verse 53, he says, You who have received the law, so you know he's talking to Jews. You who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and you've not kept it. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted, but they didn't respond the way they should have. They should have responded in repentance and sorrow for what they'd done, but instead they rejected even Stephen and now begin putting him to death. All right, verse 55, But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, 
looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now that throws a curve at a lot of people. I get question after question. Well, every other scripture says he's seated, he's <coughs> sitting. Why here is he standing? Well, I think I can take you back quickly to the book of Psalms. And uh, I'm not mistaken, it should be Psalm 60, 63. I hope it is. 68, I'm sorry. Psalm 68. And see, these old priests of Israel, they, they knew especially the Psalms. And as soon as Stephen said, I see him standing, they were reflecting on this portion, I'm quite sure. And it infuriated them, scared them maybe <laughs> into their infuriation. But here it is. Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God, what? Arise or stand. Let his enemies be scattered. And what were these priests of Israel? enemies. They hated him. All right, so let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. You think that sounded very pretty to these Jews? Not at all. And so their anger was just simply stirred all the more, and that caused them then to cry out. Now back to Acts 7, they cried out, verse 57, with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear another word like that. Ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Highlight that. That's the name of the next character on the stage of biblical history. Peter and the eleven are going to go down into the unknown area, and up to the front comes this new apostle, as we are introduced to him here, as the young man's name was Saul. And they went ahead and stoned Stephen, <coughs> who, calling upon God, said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, he died physically. Now I call that, you've heard me say it before, the crescendo, the very end of a great symphonic piece of music to Israel's rejection. It was just the epiphany. We will not have Jesus of Nazareth as our Messiah and King. All right, now then you go right into chapter 8. And again, here's where you see Saul's name coming to the top. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, the Jerusalem church, the Jewish church, not the body of Christ church, not a Gentile church as most of Christendom tries to make it. This was the church composed of believing Jews who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And they formed then, starting at Pentecost, the local Jerusalem Jewish church. They're law-keeping Jews, but they are Messianic Jews. They are not Paul's Gentiles. And keep that straight, otherwise you'll get confused all the more. All right, so this Jerusalem church then was under great persecution by, of course, Saul and the rest of the Jerusalem uh, uh, priesthood. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except whom? The apostles. They didn't leave. They didn't go out into the Gentile world. They stayed right there at Jerusalem. And in verse 3, as for Saul, he just continues his mad persecution against these believing Jews. And so he made havoc of this Jerusalem church entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. All right, now then, just to see how Paul had to live with that all the rest of his life. Keep your hand here. I'm going to come back. But go ahead with me to Acts chapter 26. And this, I think, just plagued the apostle all the days of his life. And that, of course, is one reason he was able to cope with all the hardships of his ministry. He could never forget 
the misery he had caused the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 26, and drop in, oh my goodness, verse 7, and Paul, now the apostle, he's already spent many years out there amongst the Gentiles, and he is before King Agrippa as he's on his way to the imprisonment in Rome. And he says to King Agrippa, Agrippa in uh, verse 7, just for sake of time, when you got time, read it all. But Acts 26, starting in verse 7, Unto which promise our twelve tribes, see how he's speaking to the nation of Israel, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. In other words, the still the hope of this coming king and his kingdom. Now, verse 8, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Agrippa, you should know that there is enough knowledge of Scripture that resurrection is a part of our Jewish belief. All right, why should it be thought incredible that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which was what precipitate his hate and his persecution, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Now watch this. And many of the saints, that is the Jewish believers, many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they, these Jewish believers who had been first imprisoned and then committed to death, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice or my vote against them. Verse 11, I punished them off in every synagogue where he would go in and arrest them if they were uh, gathered together in the worship of their Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, compelled them to blaspheme. Now, I feel that that's an indication of torture. I compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. And then, of course, he rehearses for the umpteenth time his Damascus Road experience. All right, but while we're still up there in chapter 8 in, in uh, the book of Acts, I want you to keep coming with me now, if you will, to chapter 10. Paul has now had his Damascus Road salvation experience back in chapter 9, and the Lord has led him out to the backside of the desert, I think, to the same mountain where Moses received the law. But in the three years while Paul is out in the desert, God is doing something to get ready for another future event. You know, God is the God of all, and he does things way back just to have something ready way out in the future. Well, in this case, I think he's getting Peter ready for a great conference in Jerusalem 12 years later. And I maintain without apology that had Peter not had this experience in Acts chapter 10, he would have never come to Paul's defense in Acts 15 and Galatians 2, where they finally agreed that Paul would be the apostle of the Gentiles. Peter would have never agreed to that. But here God had to, before anything really starts unfolding, supernaturally had to bring Peter to an understanding that God was going to save Gentile. Now, a Jew could never understand that. That was beyond them. Now, you've got to get a, a, a mental picture of all this. From the time that they came out of Egypt, what was their constant instruction concerning the Gentiles around them? Have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't do any, because if you do, they're going to convince you to worship their pagan gods, and you'll go down the tube with them. So stay away from them. Have nothing to do with them. Well, that stayed with the Jew all the way up through, even though they rebelled and disobeyed, yet it was still God's teaching the Jew to have nothing to do with the Gentile. Nothing. They were never told to go out and evangelize the Gentiles. They were to stay separated and insulated from them. All right, so now then, God has to show Peter that he's 
changing his modus operandi. He is going to go to the Gentiles, but not through Israel. It's going to be through one little Jew. Not through the nation, but through one man, Saul of Tarsus. All right, so while Saul is out there in the desert now being confronted, I feel, by the Lord Jesus himself, teaching him all the things pertaining to this next dispensation that's going to follow the dispensation of law, then here comes God dealing with Peter. Acts chapter 10, and uh, again, for sake of time, we'll just drop down to, uh, oh, verse... Seven, an angel has appeared unto this Roman officer up there in Caesarea on the sea, up there on the Mediterranean sea coast, and telling him to send for one Peter down in Joppa. And of course, then the Lord works on Peter from the other end, and he brings the two together. But all right, in verse 7, when the angel which spoke under Cornelius had departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he declared all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. In other words, this Roman officer is going to send a couple of his underlings down to Joppa to tell Peter that he has to come up and fulfill God's obligation. Okay, now at the same time, you see, down at Joppa, God's going to deal with Peter. Verse 9, on the morrow, as they went up on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour or noon. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. It was lunchtime. But the girls weren't ready, the way I put it. They hadn't completely finished fixing the noon lunch. But while they, the women of the house, made ready, prepared a lunch, he fell into a trance. All right, verse 11. Now, this is all happening in a matter of minutes during a noon hour. Verse 11, And he saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed creatures of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, a great mix of all the unclean things that a Jew would never think of eating. And what does God say? Rise, Peter kill and eat. My, what an abhorrent thing for a Jew. All right, look at his response. Verse 14, not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Why not? He was a law-keeping Jew. He wouldn't eat pork or birds of prey or anything like that. He said, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. But the voice came the second time and said, What God hath cleansed, call that not common. And this was done three times. Well, throughout the whole event, of course, Peter is now forced by an act of God to go with the emissaries from Cornelius back up to Caesarea. And you've heard me say it over and over. Heel prints in the sand from Joppa to Caesarea. Peter didn't want to go no more than Jonah did. Because these are good Jews who know better than to try to have anything to do with Gentiles. But God forced the issue. And so Peter gets there. Now, just to show you again how legalistic he is, come all the way down to verse 28. He is now stepping over the threshold into this house of these Romans. And can you imagine how that good Jew must have felt? He must have almost felt like... <laughs> The demons were just crawling all over him to come into a, a pagan Roman household, and especially the military of all things. Now, here you pick it up. Verse 28. As he steps into the, into the Roman house, he said, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man who is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, isn't that plain enough? What's he saying? Cornelius, you know enough of our Jewish customs. I can't rightfully come to a Gentile house. It's unlawful. And I'm not a lawbreaker. But, see, but God, see, I might have used this in one of my But God series. But God, see, that made the difference. God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Since when? 
since now God is ready to go to the Gentile world with salvation. He had never done this before, except in exceptions, sent Jonah to Nineveh, and in a few other exceptions, Gentiles were brought in, but on the basis of Jewish law, no, they could have nothing to do with anything other than Jewish people. All right, so Peter says that under the circumstances, I came, and so here we have the great big change of modus operandi. It's one of my favorite words, how God is now going to operate with the Gentile world as over against the Jew. And this just takes a few moments of time, and I have to do it. So Peter comes into the house of Cornelius, and of course all he can tell him is that this Jesus of Nazareth presented himself as Israel's Messiah, but how that Israel had rejected him and killed him, and how God raised him the third day. Now verse 44. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake. In other words, he hadn't even wound up his points. While Peter yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. Now, we don't know how many there were. A household, 10, 12, 14. Your guess is as good as mine. But they all suddenly became believers. That Jesus was the Christ and that he'd been raised from the dead. See? All right? And so the Holy Spirit fell in response to their believing. But what have they not yet done according to the Jewish plan? Now I've got to take you back to Acts chapter 2. Sorry about that. Go back to Acts chapter 2. And this is what I like to do with Scripture. You compare Scripture with Scripture, and my goodness, you can't help but see the difference. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Peter, again on the day of Pentecost. Who's he talking to? Jews, not Gentile. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. See? There are no Gentiles in the house of Israel. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were convicted, of course, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we the nation of Israel, what shall we do? Now look at the process. Repent. Be baptized. Be forgiven. And be filled with the Spirit. Mark them down on your notes. Repent. Be baptized. Be forgiven. And experience the Holy Spirit. That's the Jewish process. Now look what happens up in a house of Gentiles. And if you know anything about math, you invert and multiply. <laughs> Isn't that one of the rules? Well, here we have it. A complete inversion of the process. Now, instead of repenting and being baptized and being forgiven, it's the other way around. The Romans are suddenly believing and they're being forgiven. They haven't repented. They haven't been baptized. And Peter is just, he's bonkers. He, hey, this isn't the way it's supposed to work. It's all backwards. Well, why? Because we're dealing with Gentiles. We're not dealing with Israel. A whole new ball game. A whole new modus operandi. And so here it is. The beginning then of God's dealing with Gentiles on a whole new plane. Not with repentance and water baptism. Not with a of forgiveness and then the filling of the Holy Spirit, but it's the moment these Romans believed they were forgiven naturally and the Holy Spirit evidenced himself upon them and Peter was just beside himself. Okay, now then, come on down to chapter 11 just to show that this was such an unusual phenomenon. The Jews weren't used to this. The Jerusalem church had never heard such a thing. Gentiles? coming into a knowledge of our God, complete unbelief of that. So you uh, come into chapter 11, verse 1. And the apostles, the twelve, and the brethren that were in Judea, the Jerusalem church, when they heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God, 
And I imagine messengers even ran faster than Peter to tell him what had just happened up there in Caesarea. Now know your geography. Caesarea on the sea is only about 80 miles from Jerusalem. So a good runner could make that in fairly good time. So anyway, before Peter gets back to Jerusalem, messengers have come telling what happened. And so when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they who were of the circumcision, that is the Jerusalem church, praise the Lord and just pump Peter's hand and say, Peter, well done? Hardly. What'd they do? They contended with him. They argued with him. Over what? Here it is. Verse 3. They said, Peter, you went into men uncircumcised. What's that? Gentiles, Romans. And in horror of horrors, they also what? Ate with them. Now, you know, I'm always so thrilled when God gives me confirmation of something. You know, for all the years that I've been teaching, I've emphasized that I know that what really shook them up was that Peter ate ham sandwiches. <laughs> and it does wake people up, makes them smile. But here the other day, I was reading in an archaeology magazine that they had just uncovered another pagan uh, sacrificial temple place, and the place was littered with bones. What kind of bones? Pig bones. See? So I've been right all along. Absolutely. Pork was the mainstay of the Gentile diet. And so it was just natural that if Peter went in and ate for them, he must have eaten pork, see? And oh, they were all shook up, see? Okay, then Peter rehearsed the matter and expounded and telling them all the things that took place and how God was in it. All right, now then. I always, while I'm in Acts chapter 11 anyway, i got to come down to verse 19 because some people can't quite believe me when I say that the Jews would have nothing to anybody but Jews. Here it is. Verse that opened my eyes, I guess, about 30 years ago now. And it just blew me away. Now they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen. See how plain this is? the persecution that arose around Stephen, these people traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus, up to Antioch, north of present-day Beirut, preaching the word, only Old Testament, there's no New Testament yet, so they're preaching the word to none but Jews only. Now, don't ever lose sight of that. Here we are almost 10 years after Pentecost, and the Jews have made no overture to approach the Gentiles. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. And uh, again, for those of you in television, we're just an informal Bible study. I never try to grind an axe with anyone. And uh, all I want people to do is just search the Scriptures. If you disagree with me on a scriptural basis, fine. But uh, you better know what you're talking about scripturally because uh, I will not accept any man-made argument uh, or denominational creed or anything like that. But uh, search the scriptures because that's the whole idea of comparing scripture with scripture. And uh, as we put it on the screen here several programs back, always determine who's writing, who's it writing to, what were the circumstances before and behind and whatever. That's still the secret. All right, we're going to jump right back in where we cut off in our last program. I just about didn't see the end in time, but uh, that doesn't bother us any, and we're just going to keep going anyway, and I'm not going to get to the rapture in this half hour, so we'll just have to wait till our next taping. But right here in chapter 11, the verse where we were when we ran out of time was verse 19 again, remember, that these Jews who had been scattered out of the Jerusalem church went as far as Phoenix and Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word, the Old Testament, to none but Jews only. Now that's what the scripture says. That's not what Les Feldick thinks, or anybody else thinks. That's what the book says, that they were not attempting to go to anybody but Jews. But now remember, Acts is a 
transitional book. We're coming out of Judaism and the dispensation of law, and we're going to be jumping over into the dispensation of grace and the Pauline epistles. So you're going to have some flux, is what I call it. You're going to have an overlapping of the Judaism with grace, but as they go along, Judaism is going to fall through the cracks and Peter and the eleven lose their authority with the church at Jerusalem because now it's moot. Israel is rejecting everything. And then Paul becomes the preeminent apostle until we get to the return of God dealing with Israel for the tribulation. And that, of course, is where we come in with our rapture. Uh, teaching that we can't be here for the tribulation because we are not part of God dealing with Israel. But we'll come to that in our next taping, more than likely. All right, so now then, in chapter 11, we have the visible unfolding of the transition from Jew to Gentile. And if I don't take these verses, somebody is going to call and say, why did you skip them? Well, I'm not going to. So go right on into verse 20. Acts 11, verse 20. And some of them, some of these Jerusalem church emissaries who have been preaching the word to none but Jews only, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch. Now this Antioch is up north of present-day Lebanon in Syria. Ancient Antioch, of course, I think the ruins are still there at the head of the river. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they were come to Antioch, spoke to the Greeks. Now, I know the King James has got Grecian, but I think that's a, a, a gross error. It should be Greeks. Because there wouldn't have been anything unusual for them to be talking to Jews, which is what the word Grecian implies. It's a... a uh, a, Gr a Grecian was a non-Palestinian Jew, but a Greek is a Gentile. And I think some of your newer translations may have Greeks. Now to these Greeks, these same Jews start preaching the Lord Jesus. And now again, just take a minute to contemplate why did the Jerusalem church react the way it did? Now it hasn't completely been annihilated. The vast numbers, of course, have run for their life, but it's still under the control of the twelve. Don't think for a minute it isn't. All right, and so the hand of the Lord was with them. Great numbers believed and turned to the Lord. That is, these Gentiles are taking an interest now in the things of Israel's God. Now verse 22. Tidings of these things. Gentiles getting interested. And when that came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. See, that's why I'm always calling it the Jerusalem church. Now when the tidings of this came to that Jerusalem church, again, did they, like I said after chapter 10, did they shout, praise the Lord, hallelujah? Heavens, no, we got to go check this out. See, look at it. So the tidings of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas that he should go far as Antioch. Well, now read between the lines. For what purpose? To see what in the world are these people doing? They're not adhering to our Jewishness. They're bringing in Gentile. But I think I mentioned in one of my Florida seminars, isn't it amazing that God always has his own man for the right time and the right place. Had anybody but Barnabas gone up to Antioch, they would have blown the whole thing apart. But see, Barnabas was a man, now read on. Verse 23, who, speaking of Barnabas, when he came to the Antioch situation and had seen the what? The grace of God saving Gentiles. He was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave or hang on to the Lord. For he, Barnabas, was a good man. He wasn't so bigoted like most Jews would have been naturally. He didn't just have that one mindset. He had the wherewithal to see God is doing something different. And I'm not going to stand in the way. I'm not going to report this to the Jerusalem church. They'll just scream and say, shut them down. They don't want anything to do with this. All right, so he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, 
and of faith. He was God's man, see? And much people were added to the Lord. Now, what did that prompt Barnabas to do? Go look for Saul. Now, just put all this together. What in the world prompted Barnabas to understand Saul was the man that we needed? Gentiles. Gentiles. And what was the purpose of God sending Saul out into the desert? To be the apostle of the Gentiles. And Barnabas had enough spirit-driven understanding, hey, with Gentiles coming in, we need the apostle of the Gentiles. So, what does the verse say? For he departed, that is, from Antioch, went up to Tarsus to seek or to look for Saul. With purpose, he had to have God's man for the Gentiles. All right, now then, the next verse. When he had found him. We don't know how Barnabas looked, how long. But when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Now the word church is always a called out assembly. But in this case, it's a called out assembly of predominantly Gentiles. We're not a Jewish congregation. It's Gentile now. All right, and so Paul, now the apostle of the Gentiles, is the absolute answer to their need. And so for a whole year they assembled themselves, taught much people. And these followers, that's what the word disciples means. We're not talking about the 12 of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But these followers were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, you know what I have to do? Ask a question. See, that's how you learn. You know, the little kid that asks a lot of questions is usually going to be the first person in his class when he goes to school. I love kids that ask questions, but I wish adults would do the same thing. Ask yourself a question now. Why weren't the Jerusalem church people called Christians? They were following the same Christ. The Bible never calls them Christians. Who were? The Gentile believers, see? That's a point to be taken. Here at this Gentile church up in Antioch, not the Jerusalem church, but the Gentile church up in Antioch, those believers were called Christians for the first time. Okay, now then, we got the establishment of Paul dealing with a Gentile church. Now let's jump ahead and get ready for our next taping, and we're going to lay out the necessity then of a pre-tribulation rapture because of the uniqueness of Paul's ministry to the Gentile world. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. This is the dispensation that you and I find ourselves in. And so this verse becomes totally pertinent for us. Now, we certainly make it plain that Jews can be saved in this dispensation. It's going to be rare, but they can be. And we know we have a Jewish audience. We run into it every once in a while. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily believers. At least they're having a chance at it. So we never exclude the Jewish people, but it is predominantly a Gentile thing. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to start with verse 1. For this cause, in other words, what he's written now, especially in these first two chapters of Ephesians, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentile. Well, now stop and think a minute. Where is Paul when he writes the letter to the Ephesians? Well, he's in prison in Rome. But what got him in prison? His preaching the gospel of grace to the Gentile. All the opposition of the Jews, as well as the opposition from the Romans, and so it got him between the vice, and he ends up in prison in Rome, and as the Spirit leads him to write, as a prisoner of Jesus Christ on behalf of you and I as Gentiles. All right, now verse 2. I had my Florida audience try to memorize this, and I don't know how many did, but I certainly tried every night. Memorize this verse. It's not hard. 
And it just says it all so far as we are concerned in our relationship with God. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, Paul says, not to us, not to the twelve, not to the prophets, but given to me, to, not Israel, but who? You Gentile. See? How plain that is? And yet people can't see it. I've had people sit at my kitchen table and I'll read it. Well, don't get what you're driving at. You don't read. I had quite a few people come up and tell me in these last seven, unless you're right. I always read, but I didn't read. Well, that's most people's trouble. They just read, you know, and they don't stop to think, ask a question here and there, and pick it apart. All right, look at it again. If you have heard of the dispensation, this time of specific directions that's been placed on the prescription, that's what a dispensation is, remember. It's explicit directions for this prescription for this period of time in which we live. So if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you word. Well, who are the you words? Gentiles up in verse 1. See that? So this dispensation of grace is the set of directions that are given primarily for the Gentile world to come into a relationship with God. Our hope for eternity. And it's the only way you can find it. Okay. The dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you. All right, now for emphasis, turn ahead a few pages to Colossians chapter 1. The other verse I've got up here on the board, chapter 1, verse 25. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. But let's read verse 24 first. Who, speaking of himself, I, Paul, up in verse 23, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. In other words, all the privations of his apostleship, hunger, thirst, imprisonment, beatings, stonings, you name it. This was all to rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Physically, he suffered for 28 years for his body's sake, which of course he has clarified now in his previous epistles, the body of Christ, which is that composite of Gentile believers, I think from Paul's own conversion on. All right? For his body's sake, which is the church. Now here's the parallel for uh, Ephesians 3, verse 2. Whereof I am made a minister. Now, it's a personal pronoun. It isn't we. It isn't a group of people. It's the singular man, the Apostle Paul. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, Gentiles, and the final purpose, of course, is to fulfill or bring to completion the word of God. Now verse 26. This is a unique part of Paul's revelation of this dispensation, and that is what he calls the mysteries. Verse 26. Even the mystery. Now he's just dealing with one here. Even the mystery which has been hid. H-I-D. Hid. And who hides it? God does. Oh, now I've got to turn back, don't I? Keep your hand in Colossians. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy. Most of you probably know it by memory. You should by now. I use it often enough. Deuteronomy 29, 29. If you haven't memorized before, do it from now on. Because this is the secret to understanding the secrets. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And this again just shows the sovereignty of our God. He's absolute. He can do whatever he wants. All got it? Deuteronomy 29, 29. 
the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Do you see that? God has the prerogative of keeping things secret. All right, so the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed are no longer secret. They belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Now that, of course, is Moses under the law, but nevertheless, the overall rendition of that is that God is secret and he can keep things secret as long as he likes. Now, the other one I like to use as an example a perfect example of how God will keep things secret, and we almost think it's impossible under these circumstances. Look at Luke 18. During his earthly ministry, he's just now ready to go up to Jerusalem and Passover and the crucifixion. And I use these verses over and over when people try to tell me there's never been more than one gospel. The gospel as we know it, that Christ died and was buried and rose from the dead. And they say that's always been the only gospel. Well now, then how can you explain Luke 18, verses 31 through 33 <clears throat> and 34? All got it? Luke 18, we'll start at verse 31. And remember what I'm bringing here, how God keeps things secret. He can do it. Verse 31, Then, we're at the end of his three years, he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. What's he talking about? Well, the coming crucifixion. Everything pertaining to it as prophesied is going to happen. Now verse 32, he explains what they are. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, the Romans. He shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him or beat him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. He knew what was coming. It wasn't any secret to him. Now, he shared this openly with the twelve. All right, but now look at the next verse, verse 34. And they, the twelve, understood none. They didn't have a clue what he was talking about. All right, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was, what's the next word? Hid. It was hid from them. Well, who hid it? God did. It wasn't time for them to know. And all I ask people to do when I teach this, can you just imagine what would have taken place between now and the crucifixion if these 12 men would have known what was coming? Why, they'd have had a riot, they would have had civil war, they would have done everything to keep this from happening. So God just kept it secret, even though he told them. And now I maintain, here's another instance. Why do you suppose the Lord told the twelve something that he wouldn't let them understand? For our benefit. For our benefit. Now we know that he was totally God. He knew exactly what was going to happen, moment by moment. But on the other hand, he's going to keep it from the twelve. He hid it from them. Now that's his prerogative, see? All right, and so he hid it from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now, on your way back to where we were in Colossians, just stop, if you will, at uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20. Yeah, John's Gospel, chapter 20, which is, again, proof of this statement in Luke. Even though he told them what was going to happen, they didn't have a clue that he was going to die. And when they saw him dying on that Roman cross, did they just say, hey, so what, three days he's going to be back alive? No. They didn't know he was going to rise from the dead. They thought it was all over. All right, now here's the proof of it in John's Gospel. Resurrection morning, you all know it. Mary comes to the tomb, and it's empty, and she runs and tells Peter and John. Peter and John run, now verse 4, together. 
And the other disciple did outrun Peter. In other words, young John outran Peter. Came first to the sepulcher. Stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. He was a little bit reluctant. You know, little young John, I think, was timid. All right, then verse 6. Here comes big old Peter. Peter comes following him, went into the sepulcher, sees the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, John, who came first to the sepulcher. He saw the evidence and what? And believed. Believed what? That Christ had supernaturally risen from the death because the grave clothes were undisturbed. But now look at the next verse. For as yet, at to this time, they, Peter and John and Mary, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, isn't that plain? They didn't know. They didn't, as I've said a hundred times, they didn't have a clue that after he was crucified, he'd be raised from the dead. But yet, Jesus told them, but he hid it from them. All right, now then, to close out these last few moments, come back again with me to Colossians chapter 1. And you want to remember that in this dispensation of grace, Paul has a whole group of what he calls mysteries that were totally secret from everybody and everything until God revealed it to this apostle. And they come out one at a time, but they make a composite whole. All right, here we go. Verse 26. This dispensation of the grace of God includes, verse 26, even the mystery which has been hid by an act of God from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, that is, to these grace-believing Gentiles who are saved now by faith and faith alone in that finished work of the cross, to these believers now, verse 27, to whom God would make known. See, you have to be a believer to understand these things. The unbeliever can't get a, a handle on it whatsoever. It's way over their head. And it stays over their head until they become a believer, and then it becomes something that we can just feast on, see? All right, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, not among Jews, among Gentiles. And what is this particular mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Eternal glory, beloved. And that's why we can stand here without apology and say, when we trust this gospel, when we believe the writings of this apostle writing to us Gentiles, we don't have to say, I hope so, I think so. We know so. And not because of any pride on our part. It's because we give all the credit to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. That's where it's at. All right. And that is one of the secrets that are part of Paul's revelation, which no other portion of Scripture ever even hints at that God would come down and in the form of the Holy Spirit, of course, indwell believing Gentiles and make us a child of God in complete relationship with the Creator, God Himself, and He is in us and we in Him. Now we take that by faith. Now I think i got time. Let's go back and see one verse that makes that so plain. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And this we'll probably have to close. But see, this is all unique to Paul's revelations of this dispensation of grace. You won't find it in the Gospels. You won't find it in the book of Revelation or in the Old Testament. It's uniquely the letters of Paul. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 
This is how this relationship comes about, that we are in Christ and Christ in us. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, capitalized, the Holy Spirit, we are all, not just a few, not just the elite, not just the best, but every believer from the bottom to the top of the totem pole, if you want to put it that way, for every believer is baptized or placed into one body. We're placed into the whole by a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we have to believe. We take it by faith. You don't feel it. You don't all of a sudden get up and say, oh, the sky is blue. But we take it by faith. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.